Evening. I'm uh, Dave Sargent, also a member of the Miracle Living Planning Committee. And tonight we have two speakers, and I will introduce them one at a time as they come up. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Kalpana Houle, and she is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. She received her medical degree at the University Medicine and Dentistry, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Robert Wood Johnson Medical Facility in Piscataway, New Jersey. I love that name, Piscataway. They went that away to Piscataway. <laughs> she completed her internal medicine reg uh, residency at UCLA San Fernando Valley at that program. Dr. Houle has been practicing general internal medicine in the South Bay for over 20 years. She finds helping her patients very reward, rewarding, and as one of her missions, she puts maintaining a healthy mind and body as the foundation for good health. Dr. Houle loves spending time with her husband and two beautiful children. They're beautiful, right? Absolutely. <laughs> she enjoys hiking, cycling, aerobics, and traveling. And without further nonsense from me, Dr. Houle. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, as you know, um, today I'll be talking about what's in the skin I'm in and how do I protect it. So there are many different types of skin lesions um, that we see. We all have something called benign skin lesions. If we look on our skin, we can see moles, freckles, um, sometimes we have eight spots, um, benign meaning safe, they don't do any harm to us. Then we can also see skin lesions caused by an allergic reaction, very common. Uh, allergic reactions can happen from food allergies, usually presents um, with something called eczema, where you have itchy red skin, presents usually in the areas of your elbows and behind the knee. Allergic reaction can also happen because of medication, um, and that usually presents with hives. And there are skin lesions, they're due to cancer, and we have a great speaker um, that will be presenting in a little bit more about this topic. For uh, purposes of my presentation tonight, I'll be talking about skin lesions. They're due to infections. So let's get started. Um, here is uh, the first set of um, skin lesions I like to go over. Don't turn to the next page, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, so these are in four uh, different patients. Um, this is the beginning stage of this infection, usually presents with the red blisters, and they're like liquid, little fluid inside each blisters here. And then this is the um, second stage where it starts healing, and then um, eventually the rash and the blisters disappear as your body heals and then you form these little scabs. And then here, this is on the side of the face, which is usually a very common area we will see this infection. So for those of you who um, didn't turn the page, what, what do you think is causing this kind of rash? Shingles. shingles. And how many have you had shingles? Many of you, right? So it's very common. I see at least one to two cases um, every couple of months. So it is very common. So what causes the shingles? Shingles is caused by the same virus that causes chicken pox, also known as the varicella zoster virus, 
or we call it VZV. So what happens? Um, a person gets an infection with chicken pox. This usually happens when you're young. Um, Children tends to get chicken pox. Uh, the rash is a little different. It, the rash is usually all over your body when you have chicken pox. You have a cold-like symptoms. You may get a sore throat. Most of the time we rest, drink lots of fluids. You recover from the chicken pox and you move on. But what happens with the chicken pox virus once it's inside your body, it loves your body and it will stay in there forever and forever. And as we get older, um, this virus may become reactivated or wakes up from your body. Um, this virus lives in our nervous system, uh, lives in a specific area where um, there are what we call sensory nerves. Since it resides in the sensory nerve, when it wakes up or gets reactivated as we get older, our immune system gets weaker, it causes inflammation and infection of the nerve fiber. So as you can imagine, it's extremely painful. And those of you already have had this infection, you probably know it's very painful. And in some cases, although you're, you talk to your doctor, they'll give you treatment with something called cyclovir or acyclovir. Your rash will heal, the, it will get better, but you may end up still having the pain. And we call this condition post-herpatic neuralgia. It's rare, but it can still happen. I have two patients. Uh, one of them had had shingles about 10 years ago, and she still has the pain. She had the shingles on the side of her face. Um, there's no rash, but the pain persists. Um, <clears throat> So again, the shingle tends to come from the nerve, sensory nerve fibers, so usually presents in localized area. So it presents in this kind of strip-like area. So it's not like chicken pox where you have the rash everywhere, usually in a very local area. And as I mentioned, it's an infection of the nerve fibers. So as we're getting older, our immune system gets weaker. When the nerve decides to flare up, the nerve starts firing up. You may not get the rash, but the pain usually starts first. And when the pain is localized to your chest area, usually if it's on the left side, you may think, I'm having a chest pain because the pain is so severe. Now I have had patients go to the emergency room thinking they're having heart attack. They ha they'll have their heart checked with an EKG. The emergency physician will do some blood work and reassure you, your heart is fine, you're not having heart attack, go home, follow with your primary care doctor, and they'll come to the office and we'll examine and there is no pain, but we may start seeing little blisters, little red spots, and then we know it's from shingles. Um, They'll get treated, their pain gets better. So again, the shingles presents in a linear fashion in a segmental way. And this can be, um, can happen on your face, can happen on the neck, chest, back, legs, anywhere in your body. So how many of you think is shingles contagious? How many of you think shingles is not contagious? Some of you. So what is the answer? This boy was exposed to a person that has shingles. But as you can see, his rash is much different. Um, he has rash that's kind of all over is not that strip-like rash. So it's on 
kind of like everywhere on his face, is on his chest. So yes, yeah, shingle is contagious. So what happens is um, shingles can be spread to babies, other children, adults who have not had chicken pox. So if you never had chicken pox, you're at a high risk of catching that infection. So instead of getting shingles, person gets the chicken pox. And chicken pox is very dangerous if it happens in an adult. Uh, it can cause pneumonia. It's a very devastating thing in an older adult. Um, so uh, it is contagious and uh, we just have to take precaution. So how can you protect yourself from getting shingles or getting recurrent of shingles? Some of you already have had shingles and you want to know what else can I do so I don't get this painful infection again. So yes, we have a very effective vaccine for shingles. It's called Shingrex vaccine. The CDC or the Center for Disease Control recommends that healthy adults 50 years of age and older get two doses of vaccine. So if you get your first shot today, the second one needs to be uh, administered two to six months after the first one. So once you get the both vaccine, you're about more than 90% protected. Some of um, our research shows you're about 95% protected from getting shingles. So if you have had shingles, you can still get the vaccine. If you had the old vaccine we used to have called Zostavax, which is not frequently used because it is a live vaccine and also it's not as effective as the Shingrex. It's only about 50 to 60% effective. So you can still get the new vaccine. Uh, we'll move on to the next set of skin condition. So this is a little different than the shingles. As you can see, this one um, is a tiny, tiny little red bumps that kind of come together and usually starts on the face. Then it moves down to your chest your arms, your back, then it keeps moving down to your legs, to your feet, and it covers your soles of your feet. So what do you think this person has? Measles. So we've been hearing a lot about measles recently in the news. Um, so measles, um, we used to not see as much. Those of you that are born before 1950, 57, um, we know a lot about measles because most of the people before that era have had measles and you recover from measles and you develop something called natural immunity. So what is measles? What is measles? Measles is a very contagious respiratory viral infection. So it's, you know, if somebody has measles, they're near you, they cough, sneeze, 90% of people around them is going to catch it. And the measles virus can live in the air or on the surface, surfaces where a person has coughed or sneezed for up to two hours. Um, unfortunately, most of the transmission that happens, happens before a person develops the rash. So we don't know that person has measles. We may think that person just has a common cold, for example. Um, generally, the period of contagiousness is um, about five days before the rash comes. So again, you know, this is where they're gonna have a cold-like symptoms and four days after the rash. So it's very contagious, 
and measles caused total body rash and flu-like symptoms. And we, measles presents in stages. So it's not like a common cold, you get a sore throat, cough, three days later, four days later you recover. This actually goes through the stages. So let's say you're exposed to a person that has measles. So measles will come into your body, usually through the respiratory tract, like your nose, your mouth, and then the virus will go inside your lungs where it replicates, it starts multiplying. Um, this happens for the first one to two weeks where we have no symptoms. We just feel fine because during that time, your natural defenses in your body is fighting the infection. And it's working overtime, it's trying, trying, trying. And after one to two weeks, it gets exhausted. Uh, the virus is multiplied so much that your body starts having symptoms. Uh, it produces high fevers, uh, malaise, meaning just not feeling well. You get um, lack of appetite, you don't want to eat. Um, pink eye, we call conjectivitis. Runny nose, sore throat, cough. You just feel miserable. And a few days later, in some patients, we will see something called coplic spots. What are these coplic spots? So these coplic spots develop inside your mouth, in the lining of your mouth, usually near the molars. And they are little white specks, almost like if you're sprinkling grains of salt, and it looks like little, little white spots. And this is, only happens with measles. So sometimes, you know, we know there are a lot of viruses out there. Even the influenza, the flu virus, they all can cause fever, cough, runny nose. They can, some viruses can also cause rash, but only measles, we see this. So if we see this in the patient, then it's usually from measles. Um, these coplic spots. Uh, and then 48 hours after the coplic spots, you will develop the rash. And again, this rash is, starts on the face and then moves down. So it goes through different stages. And usually we don't have antibiotics or antivirals to get rid of it. So when you see the doctor, they'll tell you you need to rest. Drink lots of fluids, drink your chicken noodle soup, your body will recover. Most of the times, your body will recover. But in some cases, if you are on certain medications, um, your immune system is weak, you're gonna get complications from measles. So what are some of the complications of measles? Again, as I mentioned earlier, measles is a very virulent, potent, strong virus that really overwhelms your natural defenses. So your body's very active trying to fight this infection uh, and gets overwhelmed. So then some patients get secondary infections and the bacteria starts coming in and can cause ear infection requiring antibiotics. In some cases, people can develop something called bronchitis, inflammation, irritation of your bronchial. Bronchial means small airways in our chest, laryngitis, or croup. Um, this usually requires a lot of breathing treatment to get you better. And we also see measles can lead to pneumonia. Pneumonia is an infection of your lungs, and it can be fatal. People die of pneumonias. Um, in one in 1,000 people with measles can get something called encephalitis. Encephalitis 
is an infection and inflammation of the brain tissue. And here, a person will get headaches, a um, little confusion. Um, they can develop seizures and even die with encephalitis. And in a very rare case, uh, people can get something called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, uh, which happens in about two in over 100,000 patients with measles. So generally, we don't see that condition in this country. But in other countries, like third world country, where measles is very common, this can happen. This is a condition that can occur about 10 years after having the measles um, and can cause um, brain damage. Um, happens in young adults in other countries and leads to seizures. Um, brain continues to have progressive damage, causes dementia. Swallowing problem, breathing problem, people die. Um, measles is also very serious in pregnancy. So if a pregnant woman were to get measles, it's dangerous for both uh, the baby and the mom. So baby can have lo low birth weight, and there is very high risk for maternal death if the mother gets measles during pregnancy. So we really have to kind of protect those population. So next, I'd like to show you a short video um, which kind of highlights the urgency and the epidemic we're having of the measles. Um, this is a video by Dr. Sanjay Gupta from CNN. The measles virus is highly contagious. It's spread by coughing or sneezing, and it can live in the air for up to two hours. It's so contagious, the CDC says if one person in a room has it, 90% of the people around them will also become infected. Unless, of course, they've been vaccinated. The measles vaccine became available in 1963. But before the vaccine, the World Health Organization estimates that measles caused 2.6 million deaths worldwide every year. The measles typically starts with a high fever and then it's followed a few days later by that awful rash. It can lead to severe ear infections, diarrhea, pneumonia, even something known as encephalitis, swelling or inflammation of the brain. I consider it really an irony that you have one of the most contagious viruses known to man juxtaposed against one of the most effective vaccines that we have. The MMR vaccine which prevents measles, mumps, and rubella, is 97% effective when you've gotten both recommended doses. We know that the measles vaccine is very effective against measles. Unfortunately, there are some children that are too young or can't get vaccinated for other reasons, and they really count on the cushion of protection provided by community vaccination. This is known as herd immunity, and it works. In the year 2000, Measles was declared eliminated in the United States. That means there were no new cases transmitted in this country for at least 12 months. By 2016, the rest of the Americas and 24 European countries had reached the same status. Though there were a small number of cases every year in these countries, it was usually due to overseas travelers and the virus never spread far. Now, theoretically, this trend should have continued. If every child worldwide was vaccinated, measles would eventually be eradicated. So why are we seeing so many outbreaks now, especially in developed countries? A 2019 UNICEF report says lack of access, complacency, and fear of vaccines are all contributing to this problem. In developing countries, many people simply don't have access to the vaccines they need. But in high-income countries, some parents are choosing to exempt their kids from all vaccines out of fear, a fear that is not based on science. While over 90% of American children receive the recommended vaccines, the small percentage of those who don't is growing, and each person who doesn't get vaccinated becomes another potential host for the virus. Vaccination is a safe and highly effective way to prevent measles. Those who get the vaccine are protected. Those who don't risk severe, possibly even deadly complications. 
It's as simple as that. So, how can you protect yourself from measles? You know, like Dr. Sanjay Gupta mentioned here, uh, very important that all of us are vaccinated. If you're able to get the vaccine, it will save um, your life and also protects those around us who's not able to get the vaccine. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommends both children and adults receive measles vaccine to prevent measles. There is specific recommendation for children and there are specific recommendations for adults. For children, um, when they're 12 to 15 months old, they should be receiving their first dose of measles vaccine. And then they generally get their second dose when they start school around four to six years of age. After they receive the both vaccine, they're protected for the rest of their lives. Um, because of the measles epidemic that we're seeing, um, there is some other recommendation added to our standard of recommendation. One is for babies. Let's say you have a child that's between the age of 6 to 11 months old, not quite one yet, but needs to travel internationally. It's better if they don't travel, but they really need to travel. They can get their first vaccine early. Um, and let's say they were children, like um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta mentioned, there, there are parents and um, others, they believe in not getting vaccine, but now they change their mind and they want to get the vaccine that's never too late. Those teenagers, children can still get their two doses of vaccine. In this case, they get it about 28 days apart. And what is the measles recommendations for adults? So again, um, if you're at high risk for getting measles, uh, we have had um, um, cases of measles locally um, at UCLA. So if, you, if there are children, they're attending colleges where they're gonna come across other students. Um, they may be uh, from other countries, maybe bringing in the viruses, so it's important that they protect themselves um, by being vaccinated. Those people who want to travel internationally definitely needs to get their measles uh, vaccine. People that work in the hospital environment, uh, in the medical field, definitely need it because they're out there um, helping other patients. They need to protect themselves as well. Uh, people that are born in 1957 or later were not typically exposed to the measles because the measles vaccine came out around 1963, so those people should have had their two doses of measles vaccine. But as we get older, we may not recall whether we already had the vaccine or not. So what do we do in that situation? If you have your yellow immunization card, you can say, yeah, I received it. Most of us don't have that. So you have two options in that situation. One is to just go ahead and get the measles vaccine. Um, the second is if you're concerned about possible risk for having vaccine and you're not really sure or you really believe you got it but you just want to confirm, your doctor can do a blood test. We will we'll check um, to see if you have had received the vaccine and your body's immune to it. If that results come back positive, then you won't need the vaccine. Uh, we'll move on to the next skin condition. Uh, what's in this skin? What does these people have? This is quite different than the rashes we already saw with chicken pox and measles. This is very localized. So it causes a soreness. In the first case here, it just looks like a tiny little pimple, may got out of control with lots of redness. There's a pus in there. This is involving a person's hand. Um, as you can see, this is the normal. 
and this is with the infection. So what's in the skin right here? And then this is involving a foot. This is a foot. And it almost looks like this person has a sunburn. It's kind of red. And this patient actually needed something called IND, incision and drainage, because there was so much pus in there. We opened it up and to drain it out, and that also helps in healing. And then this is the packaging material we put in the wound to absorb the infection, helps with healing. So what do you think these patients have? So staph infection. So we're gonna talk a little bit about staph infections. Um, also, uh, no, it's, it's from the bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus, and is one of the most common cause of skin infections. One in three people will carry the Staph bacteria. We have bacteria everywhere on our skin. Commonly, this bacteria will stay in your nostrils and not cause any harm. Uh, what is MRSA? We have a lots of names for MRSA. Also stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, superbug. Why why we worry about MRSA? So MRSA is a special strain of staph infection where it becomes resistant to multiple antibiotics. The common antibiotics that we typically use to treat staph, this bacteria um, is very strong. It's resistant. So typically it will require a lot stronger antibiotics. Sometimes we have to give IV antibiotics or treat it for a longer period of time. So again, what are the symptoms uh, from this infection. So it will cause sore, boils, abscesses. The most MRSA infections aren't serious. Some can be life-threatening. So again, um, it will cause little tiny um, bumps, and then the pus gets underneath. We call this abscess. When it becomes a little more severe, it involves the deeper layers of your skin and then the tissue underneath the skin, we call this condition cellulitis. Cellulitis, since it's getting deeper into the skin than in the, in the deeper tissue and the infection keeps traveling deeper and deeper and then it goes into your blood system. And through the blood, it can travel to other areas in your body. We call that condition sepsis. And it's a very dangerous condition. Who is at risk? Who can get staph infection? Who's at risk for MRSA? So anyone can get it. Um, it's spread by direct contact. So since it presents as tiny little boils and abscesses, the pus is in there, pus can ooze out from the skin or from the wound. Somebody else touches that and they touch themselves and they have cuts or breaks in their skin, they can get it through contact. Um, about 2% of the people actually carry MRSA, that superbug that we talked about. And we tend to see these kind of infection in two main settings. Um, some of you may know, we've heard a lot about people getting MRSA or staph if they're hospitalized or they have a weak immune system. Um, happens commonly after having surgery. So if they have open wounds, the bacteria loves to go inside that and cause a serious infection if they have IV lines or catheters, 
But see, since we've learned a lot about this kind of infection in the hospital setting, we have taken many, many precautions and has made a significant improvement regarding catching MRSA or staff while in the hospital. So we actually seeing a trend that's going down. So not too many people getting staff in the hospital. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing more staff in our community. So who's in the community getting staff or MRSA? Um, these are people, again, they have cl close contact uh, with other people. Uh, team athletes uh, and teenagers, if they're part of a sports team and they may have a small sore and the sore doesn't have to be on the face, it could be on their arms, on their chest, on their back and if they don't cover it up, the sores leaks the pus and the fluid and it gets contaminated on, if they're wrestling, it get contaminated on the the mats, um, if they're using um, um, protective gears, um, it can get on like your knee pads, elbow pads, you don't think about it, but it kind of lives on the surfaces, a lot of surfaces. And then the other kids touches it and then they happen to get a cut, they can get this infection. Also, we're seeing trends of this staph infection in military recruits. Lots of cases, people with the close contact with each other can pass this infection very quickly. Prison inmates, children in daycare center. Um, although we do have an effective treatment uh, with, for staff with um, antibiotics, the person who is infected needs to seek medical attention right away. Sometimes uh, people may just discard it, saying, oh, I just have a little boil. It will heal. Um, but that boil may be infectious. Um, so I think the best thing is to see your doctor where we can take a little culture, very simple thing to do in the office. We take a little swab of the pus that's draining. We can send it to the lab and then we'll know whether this person has a simple staph or they have a super bug, the MRSA, which will be resistant to your typical antibiotics and that person needs to be treated with a lot of stronger antibiotics. So how can you protect yourself from MRSA? What can you do? Uh, Again, since the MRSA is a contact, you get it from uh, contact with a person who has MRSA, so you want to make sure you're following good hygiene. Wash your hands frequently. Um, use alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Wipe down surfaces you come in contact with um, at the local gym. You shower right away because, again, if somebody has sores and they're using different weights in the gym, that bacteria can live on those uh, equipments they have just used and then you can catch it. So you want to make sure you clean that before you use it. And don't touch other people's wounds, especially with bare hands. If you're a caregiver and you need to help, definitely wear gloves and wash your hands afterwards and also not to share razors, towels. Again, if somebody uses the towels and they have the infection, the infection stays on the towel and can be transmitted to others. And we have a more, one more skin condition that I'm gonna go over next. Um, so this is the same type of infection presents in a different area of your body and causing slightly different kind of skin condition. So this is a scalp and actually causes hair loss. So you get little bold spots. Same infection, this is the back of the neck. It causes this rash that has a very sharp margin here, kind of red and clears up in the middle. This happens in the person's foot and this is the back of the person. So
So this is due to something called tinea or ringworm, also known as the dermatophytes, athlete's foot. Even though it's called ringworm, it is not caused by a worms. It's actually caused by fungus. And this fungus lives everywhere. And we have to be very careful not to catch it. So usually, if your body has this sort of infection, it's going to present with a ring-shaped, red, itchy rash. And yes, it is looks like a ring shape. So that's why it's the term ring warm. It kind of looks like a warm. And this person has multiple rings, but it still has the ring warm infection. So there are different types of ring warm infections. Uh, they're named for the body part that's being affected. So we saw it can affect anywhere in your body. If the infection happens on your head or scalp, we call that tinea capitis, like we saw earlier, causing bolding. If it happens on your feet, we call that athlete's foot or tinea pedis. There is, if, it, if this infection happens in the groin, or commonly called jock itch, tinea chorus, and so forth and so on. And if it doesn't happen in any of the top, if it happens on the main part of your body, arms, legs, we call it tinea corporis. And usually, um, all these tinea's can be treated. Um, majority of these you can treat with topical cream clotrimazole, econazole, they have these zole endings. But if it involves the scalp or head, or if it involves your nail beds, usually the topical creams won't work. Um, then the doctor will usually prescribe you tablets, something stronger to get rid of the infections. So how can you protect yourself from getting ringworm infection? Definitely, this is kind of like your staph infection. It's very contagious. It kind of lives in a lot of surfaces, um, on the sports, athletic gears. So definitely, you know, we don't share clothing, sports equipment, towels with other people. Um, if you're at the local gym, pool, or public areas, always wear slippers or sandals. Otherwise, you'll get the athlete's foot. Uh, if you're involved in a team sport, you want to make sure after you're done with your sports activity, you go and rinse off soap, shampoo your hair so you don't catch the tinea capitis and get the ringworm in your scalp. Um, also, you want to try to avoid tight-fitting clothing uh, to not get something called tinea curis, which uh, causes the jock itch. And always keep your skin clean, dry. And it's important after you shower, you dry completely. If you keep the area moist, the infections tend to grow quickly. And what happens if your pet has the ringworm? Definitely, if the pet has it, you need to take them to the vet. And they need to be treated. Yes, you can catch ringworm infection from your pets. Um, and also, if somebody in your family has it, make sure that person in your family is treated. Otherwise, you'll get the infection as well. So in summary, we talked about chicken pox, which causes the rash when a person is young. And then 50 years later, it will present with a rash that's pretty much localized in the forms of shingles. We talked about measles. So it says, at Disneyland, smiles are contagious. So is measles. In both of these cases, 
as we talked about, we want to practice prevention by getting the vaccine. Vaccine will protect you from not getting that and not getting that. We also talked about staff. He says, I don't get it. Not a single person has joined since we opened. And we talked about athlete's foot, ringworm. Yes, it's not caused by the worm. It causes the ring. And in both situations, we want to follow good personal hygiene, avoid direct contact with people, they have sores, and those precautions as we mentioned. Thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you, Dr. Hool. I've sat there getting itchy, just <laughs> thinking about this. Uh, our second speaker this evening is uh, Dr. Dr. Joshua Tarpley. He's a Midwest native, earning his bachelor in medical degrees from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He moved to sunny Southern California for family medicine residency with Kaiser Permanente's health system. He takes particular interest in health, nutrition, and mind-body wellness. Also enjoys adolescent medicine, in-office procedures, and practicing patient-centered care. In his spare time, Dr. Tarpley loves running, the beach, trying new restaurants, and time with his family. Please welcome Dr. Tarpley. Good, e good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hool. Let's see if I can do this. All right, you guys, so I am lucky enough to be able to talk to you today about skin cancer. And I hope my goals for the presentation is that you're able to leave here having a little better understanding about the skin you're in, things to look for, okay, and what to bring to the attention of your doctor. So let's start, what is skin cancer? Well, skin cancer is simply what happens when normal cells in your body, in your skin, turn into abnormal cells. What I would like you guys to think about is there's two major types. There's melanoma and there's non-melanoma skin cancer. If you can think about it in that framework, it makes our discussion a lot simpler. Of the non-melanoma skin cancers, there's two different types as depicted by the two pictures in the bottom right. There's basal cell carcinomas and there's squamous cell carcinomas. Okay. So before we get into the details, why should you even care? Why should you listen to me about this? Well, skin cancer accounts for about a third of all cancers in the United States. One in six of us will develop skin cancer at some point in our lives. As you can see by the figure on the right, melanoma in particular is sixth among all the different kinds of cancers in the United States in terms of its, in terms of its incidence every year. This particular year was in 2015. Non-melanoma skin cancers are the most common, yet melanoma, which we'll talk about in a, in a little while, is the deadliest. Skin cancer incidence, or the amount of new cases in the United States every year, is on the rise. And likely this is, especially in Southern California, mainly attributable to the amount of time we spend outside. We live in a beautiful place, but with that, you know, our lives are outside and we're exposed to the elements much more than others. And unfortunately, the rise of uh, skin cancer incidence in the United States is likely tied to the breakdown to, to global warming, to the breakdown of the ozone layer, then our exposure to the UV light, the ultraviolet light from the sun, which is actually the main cause of the mutagenic change or the skin cancer, the skin cells change into cancer cells. Interestingly, men and African Americans are amongst the highest pe uh, people uh, with uh, have mortality from skin cancer. Why? Well, men tend to develop skin cancers on their backs, okay? And as you can imagine, you can't see back there to know what's going on, okay? 
And African Americans, we think mainly because, as you can imagine, their skin is darker pigmented, and it is more difficult for patients to detect certain de changes in their skin. And they tend to be uh, picked up at kind of later, more advanced stages as a result. So now, with the, now that we know that you know, skin cancer is on the rise, that we as Southern Californians are at higher risk, should we be all be screened? Well, as you, you know, probably don't expect, the benefits of mass screenings for skin cancer has not been proven. In fact, the, the evidence is lacking. So when my patients come to me in the clinic and ask me if I need to see a dermatologist or even a family medicine physician every year for total body skin exams, there's not good evidence with uh, proving that it's effective. But with that in mind, I do tell my patients that everyone needs to know their own risk. And what do I mean by that? Well, like we discussed, non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancers tend to be more common in males. Melanomas are common in those with first or second degree relatives that have had melanoma. Okay, so if your parents, if your siblings, if your children have had melanoma, you yourself are at higher risk for melanoma. You as a patient with higher risk for skin cancer do need to be screened differently than your friend who does not have such a family history. And I tell my patients, you know, if there's any concerns or questions or confusion about your particular risk, that is what you need to communicate with your doctor. And your annual physical exam, your annual annual wellness exam, are the times that we discuss that by going through your family history, kind of assessing your individual risk and making sure that your preventative cancer screening is up to date. Skin cancer is more common in Caucasians and those living near the equator. Um, as you can probably deduce from our discussion, you know, the closer you are to the equator, the higher incidence and higher exposure you, uh, you have to the ultraviolet light from the sun. There's something in the literature called the Fitzpatrick skin classification, and I think if we're able to kind of put this into, into perspective, it helps um, your kind of understanding of an individual's risk of skin cancer. So the Fitzpatrick skin classification is something you'll see in the literature on skin cancer. It is rated from a one to six scale, and the basic idea of it is it assesses a, a patient's risk of burning, and then therefore their risk of skin cancer. So someone like me I'm from Wisconsin, I'm probably gonna be a one or two on the Fitzpatrick skin scale, meaning I never tan, okay, I only burn, and I'm at higher risk for skin cancer. On the other end of the equation, you'll have an African American who probably never burns and only tans. And this is significant because those who are higher on the Fitzpatrick skin uh, scale tend to be at much lower risk for skin cancer. So now let's get into the specific kinds of skin cancer. If you break it down into four main types, it makes the discussion and your understanding of the skin cancer much easier to understand. There are actinic keratoses, also known as precancers. There's squamous cells, there's basal cells, and there's melanoma. As we talked about probably on the first couple of slides, the non-melanoma skin cancers are the top three, and then the melanoma skin cancers are the melanomas. I think before we go into the details of the particular cancers, understanding the, this kind of cross-section of the skin and where these types of cancers originate from uh, helps our understanding of cancer. So the surface of your skin is on the top of the screen, okay, and we go down to the deeper layers of the skin at the bottom. On the left, you see the, the, the skin broken up into three main divisions the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutis. The epidermis is the, the, the most superficial part of your skin. The dermis is the middle layer, tends to involve the major structures of the skin, including the hair follicles and the more superficial blood vessels and veins. The subcutis has main, the most of the fat 
of your skin. That is what's reflected by the yellow uh, color and the larger arteries and veins of your skin. The types of skin cancers that we're gonna talk about originate from this upper, more superficial layer of the skin called the epidermis. The reason they originate from the upper layers is they are exposed more often and more frequently to the ultraviolet light from the sun. The ultraviolet light is what causes the mutagenic or the cancerous change of those normal cells into abnormal cancerous cells. On the right, you see the epidermis blown up. On the surfaces up here, and as we go down, there's different types of cells within the epidermis. On the very surface, there's something called a squamous cell. Those squamous cells are the very most superficial cells, and they tend to be, as they mature, shed. And that is what is, is known as flaky or dead skin. As we go down into epidermis, you see these kind of pinker cells towards the border of the epidermis and the dermis, and those are your basal cells at the base of the epidermis. Scattered among the epidermal, dermal junction, are these little uh, kind of octopus looking cells, which are the melanocytes. Melanocytes are your pigmented cells. Those are what make us all unique. That is what is the main cell that's in charge of making a Caucasian a Caucasian, an African American an African American. It gives you the pigment to your skin. The types of cells that we'll talk about originate from the squamous cells at the surface of the epidermis, the basal cells at the base of the epidermis, and the melanocytes, which typically live near the junction of the epidermis and the dermis. So the first cell, or excuse me, the first type of, of kind of cancerous change we'll talk about is the actinic keratosis, also colloquially known as the precancer. These are typically located on chronically sun-damaged skin areas. Like we talked about, they tend to be near the surface of the epidermis where there's lots of exposure to UV light. And those areas typically are on the face, the ears, the arms, the hands. If you look at time-lapse photos of people over their years, over their life, people often get these more on the left side. Why? Because when they're driving the car, the sun comes through the windows and it makes these changes on their left forearm and the left side of their face. So actinic keratoses, abbreviated by AK in the presentation, provide an indication of someone's cumulative UV light exposure like I alluded to and therefore someone's overall kind of risk of skin cancer. These uh, pictures down at the bottom of the screen, you can see these, this gentleman has a lot of AKs on his scalp, cheek, malar area, and nose, meaning they are higher risk for more advanced skin cancers, and by just looking at them, you can tell that they've had much more chronically sun-damaged skin than, say, someone who's a little bit younger. So what do AKs or actinic keratoses look like? Well, as you can see by the pictures, they can look like a variety of different things, but typically they're often irregular and ill-defined, meaning they don't take a particular predictable shape. They range from about a millimeter to several centimeters in size, really difficult to um, say that they look like one particular lesion consistently. They can range in color from yellow to brown to red, even sometimes black. The rate of malignant transformation, meaning that an actinic keratosis by itself is not cancer. It is a precancer, so it's not truly cancerous. The rate of malignant transformation, meaning how frequently these lesions turn into true cancer, is about one per 1,000 lesions per year on a person. The type of cancer that actinic keratosis turns into is a squamous cell carcinoma. So as if you remember back to that diagram of the skin, the very top of the epidermis, you have the squamous cells. Those squamous cells, which make the superficial part, are either going to become actinic keratoses or squamous cell carcinomas if they become truly cancerous. So as we kind of continue to talk about the actinic keratoses and the other types of cancers, a brief kind of quick review of the treatment modalities, which will be kind of a recurring theme throughout the remainder of the talk. These lesions, all the types of skin cancers, can be treated in a variety of different ways. 
of those ways, excision, or you know, where they cut out the cancer, is probably one of the most, most common uh, procedures. There's also a procedure called electrodesiccation and curatage, which is a mouthful. Um, it's abbreviated by E, D, and C, which essentially means that they burn the cancer and then scrape off and remove the most superficial burned off portion. So it's actually not complex. If you imagine you have a superficial skin cancer, you're burning that cancer and destroying it by burning it. Then you clean it. It's like you're sweeping it off the skin, which then essentially removes it from the body. Third one is something called Mohs micrographic surgery, which is another mouthful. This is a specialized surgical procedure, typically used to remove kind of higher risk skin cancers, in particular, particularly cosmetic sensitive areas. So you'll see Mohs be performed typically on the face, on the ear, on the nose, okay? Places where the tissue, you don't want to remove a lot of tissue because if you remove a lot of tissue, you're going to really affect a patient's cosmetic outcome, okay? But you really you still want to remove all the cancer. So that's why Mohs was invented. It is a stepwise excision of that cancer followed by examination of the, of the, of the, of the skin under a microscope to ensure complete removal. So essentially you're removing the entire cancer from these cosmetically sensitive areas while still maintaining cosmesis and minimizing the amount of tissue removed. You can see in this patient in the bottom right, she had a skin cancer, likely a basal cell carcinoma, which we'll, which we'll get to in a second, on her nose. No one wants to lose skin on their nose because it's a cosmetically sensitive area. So what Mohs does is it, re it removes the cancer from this area the dermatologist, typically a dermatologist that is fellowship certified after their residency in Mohs micrographic surgery, then piece by piece looks at the tissue sample under a microscope to ensure the complete removal of the cancer. Then as the patient is left then with a, with a, a gaping hole from the excision, there is either a skin, uh, skin flap that is, uh, that is performed where the skin is cut and then uh, transferred over to close the wound or a skin graft from another part of the body. Third treatment is something called cryotherapy, which is something that probably a lot of you have had done in the primary care clinic, in Dr. Hools or my clinic, where we use a liquid nitrogen spray to spray a particular lesion, um, not always cancerous, sometimes cancerous though, basically similar to the uh, electrodesiccation and curatage, you're, you're uh, destroying the most superficial top layers of skin cells, which then eliminates the cancer from the body. And then finally, there will be some people who need some uh, topical medicine, okay? If someone has a skin cancer, say, in several areas on their scalp, okay, back to those pictures of that man that we talked about who had his whole forehead involved, it doesn't seem very realistic to treat individual lesions if you have several of them on your face. So what we have are we have topical preparations, which are topical chemotherapeutic agents. And what they do is they target multiplying cells. So if you imagine, if you have a skin cancer on your skin, it is a focal area of abnormal cells that are dividing and dividing and dividing, okay? And what these creams do, in particular a, a cream called 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU, is it attacks those areas of rapid cell turnover. By targeting those areas, these creams destroy the cancer but leave the normal healthy skin alone, okay? So what will happen, and I'll show you in a second, is people will apply the cream over their entire scalp and, they'll, and the cancerous areas will light up and be destroyed while the healthy skin will be left alone. So going kind of back to the actinic keratosis, how are these treated? Well, as you guys probably tell me at this point, they can be treated by cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen, which you see a lot of times in primary care clinic. They can be treated by electrodesiccation and curatage, again, with a hyphercator or basically a little pen that we have in the clinic that um, can burn the top layer of the skin. Then we use a curette and we scrape off the burn material, essentially going deep enough to include the entire depth of the cancer and then scraping off the remainder of the, of the, the, remainder of the portion. 
And then again, like I alluded to before, if someone like this gentleman had multiple um, cancers on his forehead, say, which is very common, it's, I mean, we're not going to sit there all day and, 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 and freeze or burn individual lesions when you have several of them. So we use a cream like 5-FU or 5 flora uracil. They apply it to the entire scalp. It comes, becomes very red and very irritated, which is an expected response to that cream. And then those precancers are, are sloughed off and um, taken care of. Okay. So I like to tell my patients, this is basically like a really powerful like microdermabrasion or a really powerful facial. Okay. Their skin looks amazing after they get it done. <laughs> Going back to the next cancer. So if we go back to our kind of cross section of the skin, we're going to go down a little bit into the still, we're still in the superficial epidermis, but we're dealing with the squamous cell. So if an actinic keratosis isn't dealt with, one in about a thousand, like we talked about, will become a squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cells, or SCCs, typically manifest as erythematous, which means red, papules, which means bumps, plaques, which means raised kind of areas of the skin, or nodules, which are raised kind of deeper, deeply rooted um, bumps. It is not uncommon for there to be hyperkeratosis, which means thickening of the skin, ulceration, which means kind of a degradation, degradation of the epidermis or degradation of the, of the superficial layers of the skin, or hyperpigmentation, which means darkening of the skin. To differentiate between an actinic keratosis and an squamous cell carcinoma, you really need to biopsy the lesion. Okay? And there's a variety of types of different biopsies that would be left to the discretion of your physician or your dermatologist. An actinic keratosis often appears very similar, as I was alluding to, to a squamous cell carcinoma, and you really do need to biopsy the lesions to know uh, which one is which. Occasionally you can tell by just looking, um, but you really do need the biopsy for final uh, kind of histologic confirmation. As you can see by these pictures, each lesion looks really different from each other. So these are all squamous cell carcinomas, depending on where they are and the person, and even the ethnicity of the person, the lesions are going to look very different. So it really, if you have a concern, if you have a lesion, and which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit later, if you have a lesion that worries you, the best thing that you can do is just show it to your doctor. So interestingly, squamous cell carcinomas are not all treated equal. There's different types of severities of squamous cell carcinomas depending on where they are or uh, kind of the, the, the nature, they, they, the, how they look under a microscope. And the reason that is important is because it dictates their treatment. So the first uh, uh, kind of the, they're, they're broke down into low risk varieties and high risk varieties. Low risk squamous cell carcinomas are typically smaller. Okay. They're primary tumors, meaning that they have not been from metastatic disease, and they're low to moderately differentiated. And what I mean by that is when the, when the dermatologist looks at the piece of skin under the microscope, there, it doesn't, the cells don't look quite as atypical as they do in high-risk squamous cell carcinomas. Okay, so high-risk squamous cells are larger. They tend to be recurrent, meaning that they either have metastasized to a different part of the body, or they have been previously treated and now they're coming back again. Or they're interestingly located within this something called mask area. As you can see in the figure, basically if they're on your face, they tend to be higher risk, probably because of the kind of the cumulative exposure to ultraviolet light that your face and these chronically sun-exposed areas get. And then finally, if they're poorly differentiated under the microscope, they tend to be harder to treat and more likely to recur. So as you guys uh, probably know at this point, squamous cell carcinomas, after our discussion, um, are treated in a variety of ways. Primary goal of the treatment is to ensure complete removal of the tumor, prevent spread, which is called metastasis, and preserve a patient's cosmes cosmesis or co cosmetic outcome. Some of the treatments for low-risk squamous cell um, include excision, like we talked about before, electrodesiccation or curatage, which is the burning and the scraping of the skin, and cryotherapy, which is the burning of the skin with liquid nitrogen. Sur the benefit of surgical excision, and I would say the most common uh, kind of uh, treatment modality for either low-risk squamous cell carcinomas or the high-risk varieties is excision. And the reason we do that is because you can um, confirm negative margins, meaning that you can make sure that you get the entire cancer without leaving any behind. 
Typically, if you have a cancer on your skin, you're gonna see it excise in an ellipse pattern. So it kind of looks like an eyeball. The reason we do that, and we typically have a margin, meaning that a four to six millimeters. So from the actual cancer, you'll see the, the surgeon uh, draw out a four millimeter margin and a six millimeter margin. The reason is because that has been proven in the literature to prevent recurrence. The reason we do an ellipse is because by the time we take that cancer out, you're left with a linear or straight scar. Okay, so that's why we do it that way. Mohs micrographic surgery is used to, uh, again, over areas where you're worried about a poor cosmetic outcome or functional outcome to the patient. And then typically, once squamous cells are removed, they typically will follow up with your dermatologist or your primary doctor every three to six months for the first two years, then annually thereafter for a total body skin exam to make sure there's no recurrence of the disease. Back to our uh, cross-section of the skin, moving down in the epidermis, we're now to the, to the junction, okay, or the border between the epidermis and the dermis, okay? This is where the basal cells lie. They create the border between the epidermis and the dermis of the skin. Basal cells give rise to basal cell carcinomas. This, interestingly, is the most common type of skin cancer, and I imagine that a lot of you actually have been diagnosed with basal cell carcinomas if you follow with a primary doctor or a dermatologist. While it is the most common, lucky for us, it is actually the best kind of cancer to get if you're going to get one because it has a very low risk for spreading around the body. Okay? The biggest thing we worry about with basal cell carcinomas is it, are its pro propensity to be locally destructive to surrounding tissue. So you can see that the basal cells tend to uh, pop up around the face. We often see it in the nose, in the ears, and where we get worried about is when those cancers go missed for years, okay? People don't come to their doctor, they think it's just a mole or a bump, and it, we, have, we don't worry about it spreading per se, but we worry about the, what it will do to the nose or the surrounding tissue as it grows because it kind of eats up the surrounding tissue and destroys it. Um, it's the most common ca uh, malignancy in, in Caucasians. And 70%, like I was alluding to, are on the face and the head. So this is a, a slide um, just to kind of highlight that there are different types of basal cells. And they're, they're called, there's something called nodular basal cells, there's something called morpheiform basal cells, which means they're more scar-like, they're more fibrotic under the microscope, and there's something called superficial basal cells, which means those basal cells, which typically are on the junction of the epidermis and the dermis, tend to float up a little bit higher towards a superficial epidermis. And that, the reason they get these classifications are how they look under a microscope. Okay, so for your purposes, it's not really important. But uh, for a dermatologist, it may be a little bit more important. It may dictate treatment. And the reason they have different names is depending on where, they, where those basal cells are in the skin and how they look. So the treatment for basal cells are very similar to what we've already talked about. They can be surgically excised. They can be burned and scraped or they can go on, undergo Mohs micrographic surgery, again, where they're, it's excised serially and then examined under a microscope, minimizing tissue loss, making sure the entire cancer is removed, and preserving a patient's cosmetic outcome. And finally, interestingly, basal cells can be treated with topical and intralesional therapy. So topical meaning cream, intralesional, intralesional meaning injection into the actual cancer, radiation or photodynamic therapy, utilizing light therapy and the wavelength of light for its destructive per, uh, purposes within that actual uh, skin cancer. Final cancer we're gonna talk about is melanoma. So again, we're kind of right at the junction of the epidermis and the dermis, and we're talking about this little octopus guy, the melanocyte, which is the pigmented producing cell of the skin. So melanoma is the bad guy in town. It is the cancer of that melanocytic cell. There are four types, okay? With that, and we'll go through them briefly, but the, the actual differences is not as important as what we'll talk about in a second. There's superficial spreading melanoma. There's something called lentigo maligna. There's something called acrolentiginous and nodular melanoma. So really complicated, kind of confusing words, um, but we'll talk about what that means. Interestingly, for um, the purposes of cancer recurrence and treatment, the thickness of the melanoma is the most important prognostic factor. So what that means, this is something called the Breslow depth. So when you look at the skin in cross-section, it doesn't matter how 
how uh, thick the melanoma is on top of the skin. What matters is how deep it is, okay? That is what has been proven to increase a patient's risk of recurrence in terms of the severity of the actual melanoma diagnosed. So if we look at the 10-year survival, those with melanoma that are less than a millimeter in thickness, 92% of them will survive, okay, in 10 years. If that melanoma is over four millimeters in thickness, so we're talking three millimeters different, that survival drops to 50%, okay? So the thickness of the melanoma, we're talking millimeters, is, is quite important in terms of prog prognostic, uh, uh, for the prognostic factors for that patient. So in terms of the different types we talked about, they look very different, okay? Uh, superficial spreading, acral lentiginous, usually I th think of the, under the nails, okay, or on the base of the feet or on the hands, lentigo, maligna, and a nodular because it's a little bump. This is probably the most important slide for um, patients, and I want, this is probably, out of all the slides, this is the one to remember, so especially for melanoma. This is what you can do as a patient. There's something called the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma detection. Okay, and this is what I tell my patients every single time they ask me about this. A stands for asymmetry. If you stand naked in front of the mirror, you have bumps and lumps and colored spots everywhere. Everyone does, okay? What's important is we're looking at, if we break it down to what's important to look for, it comes down to this slide. Asymmetry. If you have a mole on your body that is symmetric, that is more reassuring than if the mole is asymmetric. If a lesion is asymmetric, that should be brought to the attention of your physician. B is for border. A healthy mole has a symmetric border, has a clearly defined border. If that border is in one part of the area not defined or fades into the skin, that's more concerning. That needs to be brought to the attention of your physician. C is the color. A healthy skin lesion has a homogeneous color. Okay, it's the same color within the entire lesion. If it doesn't, that needs to be biopsied. Okay. D is for the diameter. Now, typically, a healthy skin lesion, a normal skin lesion, tends to be less than about six mil millimeters. So if you think about the head of a, a pencil eraser, if you put that up to the lesion, if it's less than that, that's reassuring. If it's more than that, it still can be normal, okay? But it is worthwhile showing that to your doctor for evaluation. And finally, E is for evolving. So if a lesion is evolving, if it's not the same uh, mole that it was 10 years ago or five years ago, you need to show that to your doctor. It likely needs to be biopsied. So I tell my patients all the time, that there's something called an ugly duckling sign, okay? So if you look at all the skin lesions on your body, if you have one particular lesion that bothers you, that's darker than the others, is a little more asymmetric, is a little bigger, that's the one that we should be looking at, okay? So that's something to be thinking about. You know, I tell patients all the time to have a general sense of what is normal for you. If anything is changing or looks a little different or, is, or wasn't there the month before, you let, that know, you let your doctor know. And finally, any pigmented line under a nail okay toenails fingernails needs to be looked at okay not that it's always cancer but it deserves attention and then like i alluded to in the earlier part of the presentation anyone who has a primary family history of skin cancer or specifically melanoma so that's your parents your siblings your children needs a total body skin exam once a year from a dermatologist so melanoma, unlike the other cancers that we had tons of options for treatment, melanoma is always excised. It's always cut out of the body, okay? The size of resected tissue, the amount of tissue that we take out, really depends upon the size, okay? And not the size, you know, across the body like we talked about. It's just how thick the melanoma is, okay? Before, when you were talking about squamous cells and basal cells, we were talking about the size of resected margin were in the millimeters, okay? Melanoma, we're talking centimeters, okay? So we don't play around, we don't mess around with melanoma. If it's less than a millimeter thick, we're taking a centimeter margin, okay? If it's one to two, we're taking two centimeters, okay? So we're taking a big circle around that lesion and taking the entire thing out, leaving you with a nice linear scar. For those in anatomically different areas, like the face, the ears, 
we typically you'll see people in the literature or dermatologists use post-operative meaning after the excision radiation therapy to kind of give you extra benefit and to make sure that that melanoma does not come back so interestingly I was, as i was preparing this presentation mary uh, sent me this article which that was in today uh, may 1st 2019 about a girl she's in her 30s a woman in her 30s who is diagnosed with melanoma under the nail she presented with a similar lesion to like this nail right here a little linear faint line under her nail so interestingly she was diagnosed she went to her dermatologist or or i think it was her primary doctor actually and she was diagnosed with acral lentiginous melanoma after a biopsy this type of melanoma is extremely rare it only is about it's less than five percent of the total uh, melanomas out there However, it tends to be the more aggressive version. It actually is the type of cancer that killed Bob Marley um, in his 30s. Um, so this is a really kind of serious uh, uh, melanoma. So we, I, you know, I was sitting here, I was thinking, well, how could a healthy 30, I think she was 36, year old uh, female be diagnosed with a deadly advanced cancer? Well, interestingly, she got gel manicures. So she used to get manicures from her esthetician, you know, every month for since she's been a teenager gel manicures for those who don't know are cured or are set under uv light so you see those women or men um, under at the, the you know the salon with their fingers under the under the light well that's uv light it's basically a tanning booth for your nails okay and you have skin cells everywhere including under your nails so if you have a loved one who gets gel manicures it's basically like going to tanning booths for your nails like and um, it's something to be kind of cognizant of there's something called the Hutchinson's Hutchinson sign, which is when a pigmented line in the nail extends down to the cuticle, which is the base of the nail, or extends into the lateral nail bed. That is always an ominous sign and deserves attention. So interestingly, darker skin tone, African-American patients often, if they look at their nails, they often do have pigmented uh, lines under their nails, okay? So not every pigmented line is abnormal, okay? Especially in darker skin individuals, they tend to have uh, kind of at, at baseline, normal dark appearing streaks under their nails. This goes back to that concept of the ugly duckling sign I said a couple of signs ago. If you have multiple of them, it's probably a normal variant. It's probably a normal finding for you, okay? If you have one of them, it's more concerning and that deserves attention. So now that I probably freaked you out and you're all like looking at yourself and, and booking your appointments tomorrow in clinic, um, how do we protect ourselves? Okay, so I tell people we live in California, we live in a beautiful area, um, but we need to um, know how to protect ourselves so we stay safe. Well, as you know, sunscreens are the way to do that for the most part. Sunscreens, to kind of give you guys, a, uh, you know, as you know, are topical preparations of inorganic, inorganic substances that reflect and scatter the light or absorb the UV light. Now, interestingly, UV light is not all the same. It's not all treated equal. UVB and UVA constitutes UV light. UVB is what burns you. UVA is what ages you. Okay, so there's different types of UV light and what they do is different. So interestingly, there's different types of sunscreens and those sunscreens have different ingredients. Chemical sunscreens absorb the UV rays and physical sunscreen reflects the UV rays. So how do you know what you're putting on your body? Well, if you look at the back of your bottles at home, if you see the chemicals oxybenzone or benzophenone, those are chemical sunscreens. Those are absorbing the UV light when you're at the beach, for example. If you see a, an ingredient called titanium dioxide, which is kind of the new in vogue ingredient you see on these new uh, sunscreens, those are physical sunscreens. Those scatter, those scatter the lights and reflect them off you. Broad spectrum, you'll see this all the time at the store. What that means is that it involves, it, it, it has, it absorbs both UVB and UVA radiation. Okay, so if you put on a broad spectrum sunscreen, you're hopefully you're not gonna burn because it blocks UVB and you're not gonna age, which is nice because it blocks UVA. Water resistant, you see this all the time. Water resistant sunscreen does not mean that it's, you're, you, can, you don't need to reapply it. All that means is you have 40 minutes of protection after going into water, okay? So you have to reapply no matter what you are putting on your body. Waterproof 
exceed doubles that so you have 80 minutes of protection after going in the water okay so there is no water complete water resistant uh, sunscreen on the market okay you always have to reapply SPF you see this on all the bottles what does it mean SPF stands for sun protection factor usually typically I tell all my patients you need minimum of 30 SPF 30 okay SPF 30 will cover you for about 97 percent of UV, UV radiation once you get above 30, you don't get much more bang for your buck. Okay, so, you know, SPF 45, maybe 97.7% coverage. SPF 50 might be 97.8% coverage. You're gonna pay even more money. It's the biggest scam I've ever seen. SPF 30 is really what you need. Okay, if you want 50, fine, but don't spend an arm and a leg for 50 or 75 or 100 because it's not giving you much more bang for your buck once you really get to a certain level. There's something called the minimal erythema dose, or the erythema again means redness. The reason I bring this up is I think it puts in perspective what does SPF even mean? So if you think about it this way, SPF 30, which is what I usually buy at the store because it's the biggest bang for your buck. If I go outside without any sunscreen on, I'll probably burn within about 15 minutes. Okay, let's be real. If I put on SPF 30 sunscreen, you take the SPF, and multiply it by the time of exposure prior to erythema or prior to burning and that gives you the duration of protection okay so what that means if you take me for example I go outside I'm gonna burn within 15 minutes if I don't put anything on okay but if I put on SPF 30 okay before I go outside I take 30 times 15 okay that's about 450 minutes okay so that means with that 30 SPF sunscreen I will no longer, I won't burn in uh, 15 minutes. I'll burn in 450 minutes, okay? So that's how to make sense of what that SPF means. It prolongs your amount of burn, your time you can be outside before you burn. What it takes you to burn with that SPF 30 is gonna be different than what it takes your friend to burn with that SPF 30. It goes back to that Fitzpatrick skin scale, one to six. I'm a one to two on that Fitzpatrick skin scale. If my friend is a six, that SPF 30 may last all day, okay, before they burn. However, still, no matter what level you are on that scale, everyone should be applying sunscreen about 15 to 30 minutes before exposure, before going outside and reapplying every two to four hours or so. And more frequently if you go in the water. A new kind of uh, cool, I guess, invention is something called photoprotective clothing. This is an alternative to the sunscreen. So you see it a lot in little, little kids and um, on people on the, on the beaches because it doesn't need the reapplication of, of product. So the degree of protection from this photoprotective clothing is described by something called the ultraviolet protection factor or the UPF. This describes how effective the actual clothing is at blocking the UV radiation. You can see by the figure, if you guys can see at this bottom right, there's UPF 3, 9, 30, 60, 115, and basically what it is describing is the, is the cross-hatching of this fabric, how dense it is. The denser it is, the higher the UPF, the, the higher uh, alti uh, magnitude of UV blockage. So again, UV 15, the lower numbers are good protection all the way to the excellent protections. You can find them anywhere or you can find them on uvskins.com. I don't have any connection to uvskins.com, but um, it's uh, something to keep an eye out for because for a lot of the, ta you know, the, the kiddos outside, it's hard to continue to reapply that sunscreen. If you don't reapply it and they're in and out of the water, you might as well not even be putting on it in the first place. Okay, so the great thing about these, these clothing is it, it, it applies it for you. Just don't forget about their face or their exposed arms. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. We have a pile of questions here. Um, some having to do with specifics of uh, shingles or other things or a particular cancer, but um, I'm just going to blaze away. Okay, Dr. Hool, if I had measles as a child, am I protected? Yes, okay. you're definitely protected. So once you have had measles, your body will form natural immunity 
which gives you a lot better protection, sometimes even better protection than vaccines. So yes, you're definitely protected. Okay. Um, I've got so many questions here, I'm just going to blaze away randomly. What causes sebaceous cysts on the scalp that keep recurring? Sebaceous cysts um, are very common. Um, um, they caused by um, a little sac-like um, cyst that forms right underneath the layer of skin. The only way to make sure that doesn't recur is um, you have to have it removed entirely. There's a little capsule. As part of the capsule remains inside, then it recurs. So as long as if you remove it um, entirely with the capsule, you shouldn't come back. Okay. Uh, is skin cancer only caused by UV exposure? Is are deformed genes, do deformed genes have any impact? That deformed very, genes. Very good question. Um, <clears throat> so the main uh, driver for skin cancer is the ultraviolet light, okay? Um, but essentially, if you think about what is, what is a cancer cell, it is when uh, cells of DNA, molecular structure becomes abnormal. What causes it to become abnormal typically is from ultraviolet light exposure. You do hear in the literature, I've actually seen some, you, you hear about these random kind of very rare genetic um, uh, diseases um, that people are born with that predisposes them to uh, skin cancer. If I had the answer for what, if we could predict exactly what causes skin cancer, I'd probably be um, much more famous than I am <laughs> and probably wouldn't be here. It's a million dollar question, it really is. Um, but. The UV light is the main driver for uh, skin cancer and that mutagenic change we talked about for the skin. So that's how I like to think about it. There are other kind of rare causes, but um, by far the most common is the UV light. Okay, do doctors need to have some type of certification to perform the Mohs procedure? Yes, actually. So what happens after medical school? So there's four years of medical school, then you go to the dermatology residency, which is... Uh, uh, Thanks. Um, so after medical school, which is four years, uh, you go into a dermatology residency, which has one year transition year, and then three years of dermatology. After the dermatology three years, then you go into a fellowship for Mohs micrographic surgery, which from my understanding, I think is a year to two years of fellowship training. So you do have to, be, it's after you do dermatology residency, then you do a fellowship in Mohs. Okay. Um. I've got several people asking a question about what's the difference between between measles and German measles? Good question. So um, they're very similar. German measles, also called rubella. They both present with rash, fevers. Um, measles are the ones that we're seeing um, recent um, trends and cases. Okay, um, here's someone that says, should we get the two recommended single shots if we had one only 20 years ago? Yes. Um, okay. The one that you probably had um, years ago was the old vaccine called Zostavax. So the new vaccine, which is more effective, um, you need, definitely need two doses. Okay, please touch on psoriasis. Have, I've got itchy, itchy, itchiness and scale in ears, so this presents, prevents me from getting hearing aids, which I need. How do I solve this? This is actually a very common condition so psoriasis um, is an inflammatory skin condition where it causes plaque and rashes and um, the same things uh, people can get in their ear where they're having a lot of dry skin, itchiness, and there is a topical eardrop um, that can be prescribed by your physician that can help you with that. 
Um, if you have more extensive psoriasis, not only involving the ear canal, but also involving the rest of your body, um, there are many different kinds of treatment. You can definitely talk to your dermatologist um, that can help you with all those areas. Okay, if you've had actinic keratosis on your leg three times and the first two times healed themselves, even though they were, quote, wart-like, unquote, and took quite a while, should they have had a biopsy? That's a good question. It's kind of a hard question to answer without actually seeing the lesions. Um, so typically, you, a lot of times, you can tell what an actinic keratosis is by clinical exam. By just looking at someone's skin, you can tell what is an actinic keratosis. Typically, and oftentimes, we'll treat lesions such like, with, like that without needing a biopsy. The times that we biopsy is when we clinically don't know what the lesion is or the extent of the lesion. So just because someone has an actinic keratosis doesn't necessarily mean that it warrants a biopsy. A lot of times we treat that without uh, necessarily knowing. I hope that answers your question. Okay, here's one uh, that may apply to several of us here. I was born long before 1963. My older brother got the measles. My mom took me to the doctor and I got a shot, probably in the late 1940s. I got a much milder case of the measles and was over the disease before my brother. Do I need the blood test to determine if I'm immune? Um, good question. Actually, the measles vaccine um, was developed in 1963. Um, so if you, uh, before that, uh, I'm not sure which vaccine that they're referring to, but uh, most likely if people in your family had it, you had it, you are immune to measles. But if you're still concerned because you're going to be traveling or you're in a situation, your immune system is not um, very effective, you can always ask your provider to draw a blood test. Blood test is a best way to confirm whether you are immune or not. Okay. Uh, here's this person that said, I've had numerous basal cell carcinomas. My dermatologist freezes them off, which seems to be working, but is this the best treatment? It is definitely a treatment. And um, oftentimes, basal cells being the most common type of cancer, like we talked about, less likely for metastatic spread, freezing is enough, okay? Um, and more advanced treatment not, is not necessarily needed. Even squamous cell carcinomas, which typically have higher metastatic spread, um, can be treated with cryotherapy or the freezing tend to be treated more the low, kind of how there's two different kinds of severities, the low, uh, the more kind of well-differentiated squamous cell carcinomas are also treated with cryotherapy. So cryotherapy is a very good treatment for low, uh, moderate, kind of differentiated squamous cell carcinomas as well as basal cells. So yes, I think that's a complete, completely fine treatment. Okay, if a person in their mid-30s had a light case of shingles, when should this person get the Shingrix vaccine? The, again, the CDC Center for Disease Control um, um, recommendation and the guidelines for vaccination is age 50 and older. Age 50 and over. Okay. I had a very mild case of chicken pox. Am I less likely to get shingles? Doesn't matter whether you have had mild case or full case, once you have had chicken pox, you're always risk for getting shingles. Okay, is there a blood test for psoriasis? As far as I know, there's no blood test for psoriasis. Um, I, the second question, I don't know if they're related or not, but Otesla, oh, are there long-term side effects? Yes, all these newer agents do have um, side effects and um, part of it may be also dealing with cancers and skin cancers from using biological agents like that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Is neuropathy, that is the burning of your feet and legs, also from the virus uh, that 
uh, that causes shingles um, since nerve fibers or nerve damage causes pain? Well, anyway, I guess the simple question is, is neuropathy related in any way to the same virus that causes shingles? Neuropathy is caused by many different things. The common cause of neuropathy is diabetes that we see. Shingles causes nerve or neuropathy in a very localized area. It will be nerve pain where you had the rash. So if you had the rash on the side of the face, you can get pain on the side of the face. If you had the rash in your leg, you can have the pain on the leg. But if you're having pain on your both feet, that may not be related to neuropathy from shingles, and it may be related to neuropathy due to other causes. So I would definitely suggest, you know, you see the doctor and kind of talk to you about what it is in your situation that's causing this nerve irritation or nerve pain. Okay, this one says, Dr. Tarpley, what are age spots? Are they? AKs? Good question. Age spots are actually not. So that is a colloquial term for something called the seborrheic keratosis, also called an SK, also called an age spot. Those okay. are um, lesions that take on a variety of different appearances. They can look kind of stuck on like little bumps on your face, on your arms, on your legs. People start getting them in their late 20s, even the early 30s. Um, and the, the, they're not AKs, they're not cancerous. A lot of times they can look like AKs and concern patients, but typically if you have concerns, you can show your doctor and with a quick uh, physical exam, we can reassure you that they're normal age spots. Okay, um, here's an entry. I've got a couple questions. On the subject of skin tags, what causes them? Uh, why do we get them? Um, let me see. Uh, this per other person had a skin tag which was surgically removed, but it's now regrowing. Uh, you, and what is this person's, oh, so what are, what are skin tags and what are the options for their removal? Good question. So skin tags, how I like to think about it is your skin is a, is a plane of rapidly dividing cells, okay? And your, as your cells replicate, they move from that basal cell layer, which is on the bottom of this, uh, the base of the epidermis, and move upwards towards the top. Then they die and they shed, okay? Occasionally what happens is a skin cell, as it grows and it, as it matures, instead of sloughing off, they start to grow together. And as they grow together, as you imagine, they create a little bump and they keep growing and they keep growing and they grow a little skin tag. So all a skin tag is, is a little area of replicating cells and instead of sloughing off, have kind of grouped together and, and grown upwards. They typically are, are, are form under areas of high friction, okay? So you'll see people get skin tags underneath their armpits, on their, on their neck, okay? There's of course other causes for skin tags like diabetes, which makes someone more predisposed to their formation. But the reason friction causes it is it irritates the skin, it kind of revs up the, rep the replication of the skin cells and it causes them to kind of uh, branch together and grow, out, grow outward, causing a skin tag. This is an interesting question. Why is a shindrek so hard to find? Where is the best place to get a shot that will be available for the second shot later on? That is to say, as opposed to some fly-by-night uh, drive-by thing where you get one shot and they're not there to get the second one. That's a million-dollar question everybody's asking. Um, so since um, it came out uh, about a year, um, year and a half ago, um, since there has been a, such a high demand of this vaccine, um, since we understand the vaccine is so effective, um, there has been shortage. Uh, currently, the manufacturer is giving a short supply to all the medical facilities. Um, our clinic gets every month about 20 vials of vaccine. So currently we're putting people on the waiting list who are interested in getting the vaccine. So as soon as we come in, we're giving a short supply and that's been happening everywhere. You can also try the local pharmacy. Um, you can get it there as well. 
Okay. Now I. And I, I should also mention um, um, it should be by end of this year. We should be all caught up, and I think there should, should be plenty of uh, vaccine available as we approach towards the end of the year. Yeah. That's good news indeed. I hope I get these names correct. If you use Imiquiad or Zyclara, are the precancerous lesions permanently removed? So I believe the cream you're, is a Miquimod. Um So these creams are um, typically uh, their function, okay, without getting too deep, um, is they, they um, they're topical kind of chemotherapeutic agents. So what that means, is like kind of similar to the 5-FU that we were talking about, is they, they target abnormally replicating cells and kill them, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a way to treat kind of superficial skin cancers um, with a cream, as opposed to kind of a more invasive technique. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, let's see. Is HelioCare, that's an herbal pill, effective in protecting the skin if taken daily? I don't know. I don't know what HelioCare is. Um, I'm not sure. I've never heard of it. There's a lot of stuff on the market, okay? I tell my patients this all the time. You can spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on vitamins and supplements and herbals and all these things. When it comes down to it, it's about protecting your skin with you know staying out of the sun. Okay, beyond that, don't wait. Don't spend your money on all of these kind of vitamins and supplements. That's what I tell my patients. Okay, a couple more shingles questions here. Uh, apparently, this person has ocular shingles. Can they go blind? Yes, and they can. And why only on one side? Um. Good question. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, once you have had chicken pox, this virus will stay dormant uh, in either the left or the right sensory nerve areas in our body. So um, usually you only get infection either the left side of your body or just the right, um, right side. You would not get it on both sides. As far as the ocular shingles, once the shingles infection is involving your eyes, it's a very serious condition. We usually co-manage with an ophthalmologist, patients taking um, their medications like the acyclovir, valcyclovir, um, for a longer period of time, and they need at least one monthly eye exam with the ophthalmologists with their instruments to make sure the infection's getting cleared. So if they miss their appointment, they, there are drops they have to use, they have to take lots of precaution. And if we don't do that, yes, a um, person can become blind from the infection if it's not treated correctly. Uh, this is, I think, more of a comment than a question. I've found the higher the sunscreen, like uh, 50 rather than 30, the cooler my skin is. Uh, and yes, my skin level is very fair and I burn in 10 minutes. I don't know what to do same, with that. Same. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that, the, to my knowledge, there's no correlation between the higher the SPF and how your skin feels after application. Um, probably what's going on is as you apply any sort of emollient or any sort of product to the skin, the, the rate of like evaporation off your skin is higher. And just like if you were to go out and take a jog and you start sweating, as that, that material evaporates off your skin, that is a cooling effect. So maybe that's what you're feeling. I don't think there's any correlation, to my knowledge, with the, with the actual SPF with that sensation. Okay, um, one last, one thing, last thing, on, I think last on shingles here. Um, is the new shingles shot improved and are, over, over something previous and are there any side effects? So if I can rephrase it, you're saying it, the shingles vaccine that we have currently, Shingrex, is that a better vaccine than what we used to have? Yeah. Correct, it definitely is a better, basically we have two vaccines available 
to help people prevent shingles. One is the Zostavax, which came out originally um, over years. It's a live vaccine, so it tends to have more side effects. And um, the effectiveness is only about 50 to 60%, so it's not very effective compared to the newer vaccine, the Shingrex. Um, if you get the both shots, they're about 95% effective, and it's a attenuated vaccine, so it tends to have much less side effects compared to the old vaccine. Also, um, every, every vaccines you get, yes, there are gonna be potential side effects. All treatments come with benefits, they come with side effects. So the common side effects from the new Shingrex vaccine is again, you can have localized pain at the site where you're getting the vaccine. You can get fever, um, body aches, but most of the patients do fine. Okay. Now, a few other skin-related questions here that weren't, weren't covered, but um, uh, interesting the way this is phrased. Can you explain about the overuse of hand sanitizers? Can they be? I didn't know they could be overused. Well, there are many different types of um, hand sanitizers. You know, the common ones that we use are alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So uh, if you use them frequently, you will tend to get a lot of dryness in your skin. And, you, and if you're washing your hand, especially I've seen um, cerebral patients, uh, the ones they work in medical field and they need to wash their hands all the time, uh, apply the sanitizers, they tend to develop um, eczema, irritated skin, so it's very important that you apply when you really need it, and in between you use a very good natural moisturizer um, to reapply the moisture to the skin, and if you don't do that, you're gonna get very irritated skin. Okay. Uh, can you get MRSA from uh, swimming pools, well pools, hot tubs? Does the temperature of the water affect anything? Yes, um, so you can get it from the pool, you can get it from the wet surface, but not typically from like a sauna or hot tubs because the heat will kill the bacteria. Okay. What can you use to lighten dark spots on your face? So light and dark spots, they can be treated. There are creams such as like hydroquinone creams, um, which are natural lightening agents that are usually used as spot treatments over the dark, something called, oh, excuse me, something called lentigenes, which are dark spots. Um, that is what is, it's usually a cosmetic treatment. Um, and they're usually used as, as spot treatments over those dark areas. Okay, now some, some other specifics. I've got at least one I'm gonna march over there because I can't even pronounce it, but um, while I'm still over here, someone asked, uh, niacinamide plus vitamin B, is this helpful for the skin? Nobody has a clue, right? <laughs> Are you, um, the question's referring to topical yeah. niacin or vitamin B, or is it more referring to tablets, well, taking supplements? I frankly don't know. The total words on the paper are niacinamide, vitamin B, help for skin. Yeah, I'm not aware of any studies. Okay. They show that there is benefits on those. Okay, there's another one. A lot of people have these ideas of things that for, please discuss Meta Honey as a skin repair aid. I'll take that 
take this one. Um, so the, I actually get a lot of questions all the time about these new products in the market, and uh, I, there's a lot out there, especially like the, 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 the honey products. And when it boils down to it, to my knowledge, in the literature, there's not great head-to-head -head studies comparing these products to others. When it comes down to it, the best kind of products for skin rejuvenation and skin, um, skin repair is a good moisturizer, okay, a daily antioxidant for, you know, during the day, and then occasionally using um, a product that um, kind of regenerates the skin, so something like that makes your skin uh, uh, turn over, okay, so something like tretinoin cream, for example, before you go to bed. Um, and then a daily moisturizer to maintain that the moisture of the skin, which is especially important as you get older because your skin will get drier as you get older. And then if you wanted to do something maybe during the day, like an antioxidant to protect the skin, um, something with like vitamin C in it, you'll see in the products. All the honey products, to my knowledge, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of good data behind. Okay, what causes eczema? Is it hereditary and what is the cure? So e eczema, um, what causes it? Well, so it's how I like to think about it is eczema tends to run in families in that it's typically found in a triad, something called an atopic triad. So those who um, have allergies, have asthma, will tend to have eczema. And how I like to think about it is those patients tend to have immune systems that are a little bit more hyperactive, right? So if you have asthma, your airways are a little more hyperactive to cold air, to, all to environments of allergies, for example. Um, if you have, and then that also manifests in the skin. So your skin is more sensitive to environmental um, allergens, and it causes your skin to um, kind of have a localized kind of hyperactive immune system. So like we looked at the cross-section of the skin, you have immune cells in the, in the dermis and in the subcutis, and when it sees an allergen, perhaps that wouldn't bother your friend, when it lands on your skin, your immune system kind of starts revving up under the skin in the dermis and the epidermis and causes a local uh, reaction. That is eczema. Okay, what is dandruff? Dandruff is basically a fancy word for sloughing off of your epidermis in your hair, in your scalp. Okay, so like Dr. Hu was saying, in every hair follicle, you have a sebaceous gland. A sebaceous gland is, creates oils and, 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 and things that keep the hair nice and moist, okay? As you get older, or some people as they're younger, their hair follicles aren't as, um, they don't produce as much natural oils, and that creates their hair and the skin around the hair to become very dry. As that skin becomes very dry, it starts to flake off. And as you, you, when it flakes, that from the scalp is called dandruff. I'm going to march this one over here because I can't pronounce any of these. And you might be able to help them on that. So this question is, if possible, describe folliculitis. Um, I think that's what that says. So all folliculitis is, so your hair follicles in your skin, like we saw in that one cross-section of the skin, the hair follicle is rooted in the dermis, and then it travels up through the epidermis until it pokes out and you see a hair. That hair um, is actually, at the microscopic level, a little indentation in the skin, and it can get infected like any part of your body can get infected. So if that individual hair follicle becomes infected, if a little bacteria crawls down there and sets up shop, it will create a little infection in that hair follicle, okay? That is what is called folliculitis. When you see it, it tends to be, basically you really notice people's pores. Their pores will look red, they'll look, inf they'll look hot and infected. It's because that individual pore, which is a follicle, is infected, and that's what a folliculitis is, typically treated with a course of topical antibiotics or an oral antibiotic. Okay, I have one last question, if the person that wrote it is still here. Um, I'm not going to present this to the doctors because it not only is it long and complicated, but it's very specific. I suggest if they're willing to talk to you about it that you do so. I'll be glad to re 
hand this back to you. But otherwise, whew, we've gone through a blaze of questions, and I want to thank our panelists for a tremendous evening.